This video is a continuation of the previous video on empirical formulas. Today we'll be taking our empirical formulas, which are a ratio of atoms in a compound, and converting them into molecular formulas, which are formulas that actually represent the compound itself. A quick overview here. Uh, we're going to go over some of the same definitions all over again. This will be a repeat from previous videos, so if you feel like you're comfortable, feel free to skip over this section. Uh, we'll do a little bit of a review of empirical formulas and where they come from. We'll talk about the mathematics very quickly that lead up to creating an empirical formula. And then most importantly, we'll focus today on actually calculating the molecular formula of your compound, uh, coming from the empirical formula and from the empirical formula itself and from molar mass data that we'll be collecting from a device such as this one right here, which is known as a mass spectrometer. So, just like we said, we'll do a quick review of some of the older material. Uh, first of all, um, these types of calculations with empirical and molecular formula are basically the reverse of a percent composition calculation. So if you recall, percent composition is the mass fraction of each individual element in a compound represented as a percentage of the molar mass or the total mass of the entire compound itself. As always, our example here is copper sulfate. 39% uh, of the total mass of copper sulfate comes from the copper atoms, 20% comes from the sulfur atoms, and 40% comes from the oxygen atoms. And it's just a different way of representing the distribution of elements in the compound itself. Up here it's represented with numbers of atoms. Down here it's represented as a percent of a total mass. Different way of representing the same information. Again, as a quick review, empirical formulas, we've already talked about how to calculate, represent the ratio of atoms in a chemical compound, a 1 to 2 ratio or a 1 to 1 ratio, whereas today we're more interested in this guy, a molecular formula. The molecular formula represents the actual numbers of atoms in the compound itself. It's a real representation of what that molecule is made of. And it has the same ratio as our corresponding empirical formula, but not necessarily the lowest whole number ratio. It could be double or triple that lowest whole number ratio. So our job today then is to translate the empirical formula that we got from before and mathematically calculate a molecular formula from that. Again, the last phase here in our review process, we'll talk about where these empirical formulas actually come from. Uh, if you recall, this is a diagram of what a combustion analysis device will get us. We burn the sample here in the furnace compartment. The O2 pushes all the products of that combustion down these tubes, and then the products are selectively caught in these individual traps. And we talked about how the mass of the trap before and after can be used to determine the mass of each of these two guys collected and then ultimately this information can combine to get us our formula how much carbon was in our substance and how much hydrogen was in our substance so those are concepts that were covered in our previous video that information ultimately leads us to percent carbon data and percent hydrogen data and then ultimately those calculations then allowed us um, to calculate the percentages and come up with what we would describe as an empirical formula it is the simplest whole number ratio in this case it's a three to eight ratio of carbon atoms to hydrogen atoms if any of this stuff doesn't seem uh, obvious to you, if any of this stuff seems a little bit murky, please go back to the empirical formula video. It'll cover all of these concepts in much more detail, hopefully get you back up to speed and ready for what we're about to talk about next. So let's get into some of the new material then. A uh, molecular formula is intense, the same exact ratio as an empirical formula has. So if your empirical formula said your ratio was 1 to 1, then your molecular formula is also going to have a 1 to 1 ratio. A great example of this uh, could be, again, the compound CH3. This could be your empirical formula representing a 1 to 3 ratio of carbon to hydrogen. However, the real compound might not have this many carbons and hydrogens. Maybe it's really this, C2 H6. Uh, this would be an example of a molecular formula because it's the same ratio. It's still a 1 to 3 ratio, but now we can actually show the compound contains two carbon atoms and six hydrogen atoms, but again, still in the ratio of 1 to 3.
Our job uh, is to determine what the correct molecular ratio actually is uh, simply by comparing the molar mass of the actual compound to the molar mass of our empirical formula. And I'm going to show you the mathematics that go along with this. If those molar masses match, you have this situation where your empirical formula is the same thing as your molecular formula. And that is certainly a possibility, in fact, a common possibility. If your molar mass is bigger, so if your molar mass is bigger than your empirical formula mass, that means we have to make some mathematical adjustments until they match. Before we dive into the actual mathematics that explains how we figure that out, let's talk a little bit about the process for determining the molar mass of your unknown, process, unknown substance. Uh, that methodology is something known as mass spectrometry, uh, a very important uh, technologic or technique, I should say, uh, in the science world. It's basically an experimental method along with the device that measures the mass of an unknown substance, and it does this using some pretty straightforward physics. Here we have a diagram, and I said straightforward, and all of a sudden the diagram looks very complex. Uh, but in actuality, what's going on here is relatively simple. Uh, over on this side of the machine, right here, we inject an unknown sample. It gets heated up and then blasted um, with this beam of electrons, and that ionizes the sample. It basically gives it a charge. Those charged particles are then passed through these plates, which accelerate the particles along this pathway here. Those charged particles pass through a magnet, and then they're detected on the other end by this detector over here. Now, all of this, the way this all works here, is by using momentum. And if you recall, momentum is equal to, so here's rho for momentum, it's equal to the mass of your object times its velocity. And basically what it boils down to here is as your particles travel down this pathway here, the momentum of the particles is going to mean that the particles want to keep traveling. The momentum of our particles here means that the particles are going to want to keep traveling in a straight line path, but the magnet's going to force them to bend. The heavier particles are going to bend less, and they're going to hit this side of the detector. The lighter particles, because they have less momentum, are going to bend more, and they're going to hit this side of the detector. So what's basically happening here is you get a separation of your particles along the length of the detector based off of mass. And the, mat the protector then can figure out where you hit the actual detector and correlate that back to the mass of the particle itself. Because we know the velocity we accelerate the particles at, because we know the force exerted by the magnetic field, uh, some physics calculations would allow us then to mathematically relate location over here on the detector back to the mass of the original sample. I don't expect you guys to be able to do a whole lot with mass spectrometry, uh, simply to understand that it's a device that uses magnets to separate particles by mass and then report out to us those molar masses. Let's take all that information and fold it up into an actual problem here. Our mathematics here told us that the empirical formula of our compound is C3H8. This would be steps that you would have taken from the previous set of practice problems. Now, running the same sample through a mass spectrometer told us that the actual molar mass of the real compound is 132.29 grams per mole. If the empirical formula was the actual formula or the molecular formula of the compound, these two guys should be the same. In order to calculate the actual formula, the molecular formula of this particular compound, we need to know this compound's molar mass and compare it to what the molar mass should be. As always, to calculate molar mass, we're going to take the mass of the individual parts. We're going to take 3 times the mass of the carbon, 12.011. And we're going to add that to 8 times the mass of the hydrogen, 1.00794. And that'll tell us the molar mass of the entire substance. According to my calculator, I get an answer of 44.10 grams per mole. What we can immediately see is that the molar mass of our empirical formula does not match the molar mass of our molecular formula, the real molar mass of the substance. Ergo, this cannot be the molecular formula. It is simply the empirical formula. What we have to do, though, is we have to come up with a way of getting these two things to match. One of the simplest ways to do that was some very simple guessing and checking. Without changing the two or without changing the three to eight ratio here, we can make a new formula, which would be C six H sixteen. It's still an eight to three ratio, but I basically doubled the formula. We can calculate a new molar mass from this, and we get the answer eighty-eight point two zero grams per 
mole. And we notice that this still doesn't match the number here. So this is in our correct formula. The next opportunity we can ask then is maybe we try tripling this. If we triple it, it's going to become C9H24. Uh, Again, we can add all these things together, and I think we see something in the vicinity of 132.3 grams per mole. Now, this molar mass is pretty darn close to the actual molar mass of the substance, meaning this must be the molecular formula of our compound. It has the same ratio of carbon to hydrogen, the 3 to 8 ratio, but now it has numbers, actual carbon atoms and actual hydrogen atoms that have a mass that match the information or mass spectrometer told us about the real mass of our substance. So in actuality, getting a molecular formula simply requires you to get an empirical formula, calculate its molar mass, and then do some guessing and checking to figure out how to get it to match the actual one. Now, there is a formula you can do for this if you like formulas. Uh, for example, if we take the, a the actual molar mass divided by the molar mass of the empirical formula, this is going to get us some number value here. In this case, it gets us the answer of 3, which tells us the correct multiplier to use on our formula to go from empirical to molecular. I think this is a little unnecessary, a little extra baggage to carry around. But again, if you like formulas as opposed to more of a free-form approach, this might be the way for you to go. So to wrap the process up then, this is the same exact list of steps I had in the previous video, except now we're focusing on how to calculate the molecular formula as opposed to the empirical. So all of these steps were discussed and demonstrated in the previous video on uh, empirical formulas. Go back and check that if you want some information. When you get your empirical formula data, you can then plug that into this series of steps down here in order to ultimately calculate a molecular formula, which is the stuff we just went through. Calculating the molar mass of your empirical formula, compare it to the given molar mass from your mass spectrometer, and then make adjustments to your formula either via the equation or guessing and checking until the molar masses match. And that's basically the process. As a way of wrapping this whole thing up with empirical and molecular formulas here, uh, I have an example problem. I think you guys are ready to actually try this on your own. Uh, down below here we have the combustion analysis data that can be used to calculate an empirical formula some number of Na's combined with some number of H's combined with some number of carbons combined with some number of oxygens. Your job is to figure out what these subscripts are via these percentages. Once you have this empirical formula, you'll then compare it to the given molar mass ultimately to calculate molecular formula. Use the steps from before, use the examples we've already done, pause the video and give this problem a try. I'll have an answer up in about 10 seconds. So here's our answer to our problem really quickly. Uh, we started with our individual percentages. We converted them directly into a grams by assuming a 100 gram sample as discussed in our previous video. We convert those samples into moles using their molar masses from the periodic table and ultimately we get this ratio of mole values. In order to convert these into whole number ratios for a formula, we're going to take each of these values and divide it by the lowest number. In this case that's 1.19. As we can see we're going to get a lot of ones in this. And then this last step here will get us our value. At the end of the day, when we do these uh, things here, we're going to get one for this guy, we're going to get one for this guy, we're going to get one for this guy, and we're going to get three for our oxygen. All of this translates into our formula here, which ends up being NaHCO3, or sodium bicarbonate. Now, originally, we talked about the fact that the actual molar mass of sodium bicarbonate, of, the, of this substance anyway, is 84.01. When you calculate the molar mass of our substance here, you're actually going to get 84.01. And what you'll notice in this scenario is that the molar mass here already matches the molar mass of our, of our, um, of our substance, meaning that the molecular formula is also Na. HCO3. And this is a very common outcome where the molecular formula and the empirical formula are indeed the same thing. Um, but again, because the molar mass is matched, we know that this empirical formula, the simplest total number ratio, is the actual formula of the compound itself. This formula actually has one sodium atom, one hydrogen, one carbon, and three oxygens.
So that sums up our video. Uh, at this stage in the game, you should be able to describe the differences between an empirical and a molecular formula. And then most importantly, you should be able to calculate a molecular formula from two things. First of all, the empirical formula data uh, that you got from the previous um, set of calculations from our previous video, and from the molar mass data given to us from a mass spectrometer. Uh, as always, in class, we'll have a bunch of these for you guys to work on. I believe there's a bunch more linked at the bottom of the page here. Um, and obviously, bring questions in. If you have those, we'll be glad to address them and uh, figure this out.